Good afternoon. Before I get to an update on COVID-19, I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that Alberta has declared this as Truth and Reconciliation Day. It's also known as Orange Shirt Day, and it's an opportunity for all of us to pause and remember the tragedy of Canada's Indian residential school system. I encourage all Albertans to pause and uh, remember the tens of thousands of Indigenous children who were forcibly separated from their families, and so many of them to face oppression of their language, their culture, and their way of life, and some even to face abuse and maltreatment by those entrusted to care for them. The injustices of that era reverberate down to our own time in so many ways. So this is a time for all of us to learn more about this tragic history and to rededicate ourselves to the essential work of reconciliation with First Nations, lest we forget. Let me provide an update on recent developments regarding COVID-19 in Alberta and the enormous pressure that it's placing on our healthcare system. Province-wide, we have seen the rate of transmission come down to a level of 1.02, and we've seen new case numbers largely plateau over the last couple of weeks. But we are continuing to see growth in under-vaccinated rural areas, and of course, the pressure on our hospitals is severe. So we must all continue uh, to do what we can to reduce transmission uh, and, of course, to increase the number of people who have the protection of vaccines. As of this morning, we had uh, 247 COVID patients in intensive care, down from 257 the previous day, and roughly flat with where we were a week ago. With 60 non-COVID ICU patients, we have a total of 307 intensive care patients in our hospitals. With ongoing efforts to expand capacity, we now have 372 available ICU beds, so we're operating at 83% of intensive care capacity. While it's encouraging that we've been able to ensure intensive care for those who need it by opening up more uh, spaces, it has come at a real cost, both in terms of the a huge stress on our amazing frontline health professionals, but also due to postponements of surgeries and other medical procedures. So it is important to note that we are not the only province uh, to have gone through such a challenging period during COVID. Our per capita COVID ICU admissions are pretty much exactly where Ontario was during their spring wave and are well below where Manitoba was when they had to transfer ICU patients out of province. Uh, and uh, we are below Saskatchewan's current per capita level of COVID intensive care admissions. Now, I don't say any of this to diminish the very severe pressure that our hospitals are facing, but rather to point out that we as Canadians really are all in this together. We've had ongoing collaboration with other provinces on how best to deal with the surges and hospitalizations like this, and Alberta has always been there to support our fellow Canadians when they needed a helping hand. That's why we shipped cargo planes full of personal protective equipment and over 100 ventilators to Ontario, Quebec and Nova Scotia during the first wave. It's why we accepted overflow ICU patients from Manitoba in the spring and offered the same assistance to Ontario at, the, at that time. In fact, we currently have nine ICU patients from other provinces, including British Columbia, in our intensive care units now. It's also why we will continue to provide key medical support to the residents of the Northwest Territories who are experiencing a fourth wave very similar to our own. Now that Alberta is experiencing the most intense pressure on our health system during COVID, we appreciate reciprocal offers of assistance from other provinces and the federal government. I can announce that we are finalizing arrangements to welcome a team of medical personnel from the Canadian Armed Forces we understand that they may be able to provide eight to 10 ICU trained staff, which would help us to staff up to two additional ICU beds. In my conversation with the Prime Minister yesterday, I said that every bit helps and we truly appreciate the assistance. This team will likely be located at Canadian Forces based Edmonton, supporting the Edmonton area hospitals where the need is greatest in those, I should say in those hospitals in the Edmonton area, which have the greatest need. We're also working with the Canadian Red Cross to welcome up to 20 trained staff, some of whom will have general training and some of whom may have ICU experience. These staff will likely be asked to help at the Red Deer Regional Hospital, which is under severe stress given low vaccination rates in rural central Alberta. 
Finally, we are completing plans with the province of Newfoundland and Labrador to welcome a medical team, which we expect will include about five or six ICU experienced staff who will likely be deployed to the Northern Lights Regional Health Centre in Fort McMurray. I really want to thank my colleague, Premier Andrew Fury, for reaching out to us earlier in September to offer the same kind of assistance that Newfoundland and Labrador provided to Ontario in the spring. As he joked with me, Fort McMurray is Newfoundland's second largest city. So this is a wonderful gesture from a province whose people have done so much to build Alberta's prosperity. While details are still being finalized, uh, these contributions may help us to staff four or five additional ICU beds and provide other support. I know that Alberta healthcare workers will be grateful for the helping hand and that all Albertans are thankful for any assistance at this challenging time. In my conversation with the Prime Minister yesterday, I also asked that the federal government provide us with an inventory of the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. Uh, we've heard from a growing number of unvaccinated Albertans that they are willing to receive the Johnson & Johnson vaccine rather than the three other vaccines currently available here. Obviously, we want to do everything we can to help get these folks the protection that they need. Saskatchewan and British Columbia have joined us in this request and the Government of Canada has committed to procuring a supply of J&J &J doses as early as next week. I also urged the federal government to accelerate approval of more self-administered and non-invasive rapid test kits. A growing number of Alberta businesses are introducing uh, mandates for their staff to show proof of vaccination or regular negative test results. This is leading to a supply shortage of rapid test kits, which can be a useful additional tool in limiting the spread of COVID and keeping workplaces safe. Health Canada has been slow to approve rapid test products. In fact, the European Union has approved 133 rapid antigen tests. The United Kingdom has approved 36, but only 12 of these are approved for use in Canada. I raised this issue last week with Canada's premiers at the Council of the Federation, and we have signed a joint letter calling on Ottawa to accelerate approval of rapid test kits so that we can address the growing demand. As mentioned, over the past two weeks, I've spoken to the majority of Alberta's largest private sector businesses about the importance of ensuring that their employees are vaccinated to protect their fellow workers, but also to help us reduce the pressure on our hospitals. I want to thank those employers for stepping up, uh, stepping up to the plate with safe workplace policies. Thanks in part to their efforts, together with Alberta's $100 vaccine incentive and the new restriction exemption program, we have seen a very significant increase in vaccine uptake over the past three weeks, going from 78% of first dose coverage of elig eligible people on September the 3rd to nearly 84% by the end of today. That means that over 200,000 more Albertans now have protection from due to COVID vaccines over the past three and a half weeks. That's great news, but we have to keep the momentum going. And that is why the COVID Cabinet Committee today approved a requirement that all 25,000 employees of the Alberta Public Service show proof of vaccination or a negative regular test results. The majority of employees within the broader Alberta public sector, including Alberta Health Services, post-secondary educational institutions, and government agencies, boards, and commissions have already adopted similar policies. Public Service Commissioner Tim Grant will provide more details about this decision in a few minutes, but the message is clear. We value our public servants and the important work that they do. That's why we want to ensure that they are operating in safe workplaces and that we are doing everything we can to protect the millions of Albertans to whom they provide services. That's also why the Ministers of Health and Education will be writing to school boards across Alberta in the days to come to ask that they consider adopting similar policies for their employees, including Alberta teachers. Finally, let me once again thank our world-class frontline healthcare professionals who are working under great stress in hospitals across the province. And to the 16% of Albertans who have not yet received the life-saving protection offered by vaccines, let me say this. Those healthcare workers want to give you the best care possible if and when you need it. Whether it's a car accident, a heart attack, or COVID-19, they're doing everything they can to be there for you. 
So please, if you're unvaccinated, be there for them, for those healthcare workers by getting vaccinated as quickly as possible. With that, I will uh, now turn the mic over to Minister Copping and we'll then hear from uh, Dr. Yu and Commissioner Grant. Thank you, Premier, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that today, September 30th, is Truth and Reconciliation Day. And as, as noted by the Premier, it is important that we, remember, that we remember and learn from our past so we can make positive change in the future, lest we forget. Normally, Dr. Hinshaw would be here today to provide COVID's update. Uh, she is away today dealing with a personal matter but we have posted updated COVID-19 data online. As I said on Tuesday, this fourth wave has shown just how essential the healthcare system is to every Albertan. The surge of admissions that have flooded our hospitals is affecting all of us. My immediate priorities are to increase capacity and reduce the pressure on our hospitals and ICUs to help get Albertans through this crisis. Every day we are seeing more hospital and ICU admissions. Every day, despite the work of Alberta's exceptional healthcare professionals, the pressure on our healthcare system grows. Every bed counts right now. Now, AHS has taken steps to rise to the challenge to increase their capacity, but they are approaching their limit and cannot expand, keep expanding forever. And that's why I'm grateful we have reached out to accept the offer of assistance from the Canadian Armed Forces, Red Cross, and others. I want to thank the federal government and particularly our neighbours in Newfoundland for offering us to send trained medical personnel. We are doing this because we know that our health care system is under duress and our people need assistance. We are doing this to be prudent. In the event of a worst case scenario, we, we will have the most possible amount of resources here in Alberta to handle it. And if cases do come down, this will help take the strain off the system as we resume surgeries. So I want to thank our neighbours for coming to help. And once again, I would like to thank our healthcare professionals here in Alberta for the incredible work that they are doing to build capacity. We are pulling out all the stops to build capacity, but we still need to do more. The reality is the work that needs to be done is to decrease the strain on our healthcare system and decrease the spread. Make no mistake, our system is under extreme duress right now. And one way out of it is for more unvaccinated Albertans to get vaccinated in our hour of need. The evidence is clear. Vaccines are safe and they save lives. Now I understand that some people do have concerns. So if you have questions or have heard something uh, concerning uh, in social media, now is the time to ask those questions and to have those conversations. Listen to the many videos, social media posts, and other materials made by Dr. Hinshaw and countless other doctors, nurses, and scientists who publicly support vaccination. Or better yet, talk to your own family doctor, nurse practitioner, or pharmacist, pharmacist and get the facts. Have the conversation, get vaccinated, protect your family, and protect our health care system. We are doing everything possible to support AHS to increase capacity and steer our province through this very difficult time. But the choice to get vaccinated has never mattered more right now. And it impacts not only you and your loved ones, but the healthcare system that we all rely on to provide compassionate care to all Albertans. So please make that phone call right now, get that information and get vaccinated. And please also limit your interactions in accordance with the health guidelines. And together we can get through this fourth wave. I will now invite Dr. Yu to provide a more detailed update on the healthcare system and the new steps being taken. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to recognize the first ever National Day for Truth and Reconciliation by acknowledging that our work takes place across Alberta on historical and contemporary Indigenous lands, including the territories of Treaty 6, 7, and 8 and the homeland of the Métis. I also acknowledge the many Indigenous communities that have been forged in the urban centres across Alberta. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. 
We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of truth, reconciliation, and collaboration. We also honor the lost children and survivors of residential schools, as well as their families and communities. By acknowledging and understanding the past, we can take steps to move forward towards reconciliation. Today, we are saddened by the death of one of our nurses who worked in the ICU and emergency departments. Our thoughts are with the family and loved ones and with her colleagues. Our frontline physicians and nurses are under extreme stress and pressure. The pandemic is impacting individuals and our teams, both physically and mentally. Our people have been working tirelessly to care for Albertans throughout this long and exhausting pandemic. We understand and acknowledge the stress and the strain they're under, as well as the impact that this is having on their families and loved ones. AHS is taking all the steps necessary to ensure that we continue to support our frontline healthcare teams. If anyone at AHS in Alberta is struggling, we're asking you to reach out for help. We are here for you and you are not alone. Our hospitals continue to experience unprecedented pressure and our ICUs in particular remain under immense strain. You've heard already that we have currently 300, uh, sorry, that we have 307 patients in ICU with a total ICU capacity of 372 ICU beds open in Alberta, including in 200 additional spaces. We have opened 23 additional ICU surge spaces in the past seven days. Provincially, our ICU capacity, including the surge beds, as is at 83%. Without the additional surge spaces, provincial ICU capacity would be at 179%. We continue to see more patients needing critical care. For example, yesterday, we had 27 patients with COVID who needed to be admitted to the ICU, one of the highest number of daily admissions this month. We want to again thank our teams who have worked to open these additional ICU spaces but we need everybody's help to reduce the pressure on the healthcare system. Our teams are doing all that they can, but we need Albertans to do their part. So please get immunized as quickly as you can, follow the public health restrictions, and importantly, please stay home and away from others if you're feeling unwell. Today is another difficult day, but I have faith that we can get through this if everyone does their part. If you haven't yet been immunized and would like to speak to someone about booking an appointment or talk through any concerns about the vaccine that you may have, we are here for you. Please call 811 to have a conversation. Thank you, and I'll pass the podium to Tim Grant, Alberta's Public Service Commissioner. Good afternoon. Today I speak to you from the traditional lands of Treaty 6. As the Premier, Minister Copping, and Dr. Yu have mentioned, this is a special day. It focuses our attention on a journey that we must, a journey of reconciliation that we must take responsibility for. This must be a journey and not just a day. I know I speak on behalf of all the members of the Alberta Public Service, and our hearts and souls are with all who are suffering, remembering, and recovering today. As the Premier noted, the Government of Alberta is implementing a proof of COVID-19 vaccination policy for all Alberta public servants. Vaccines are proven to be a safe and effective may way of limiting the spread of infection and preventing serious health outcomes. This is why we're implementing a proof of vaccination or ongoing negative test requirement for all Alberta Public Service employees. Unvaccinated employees will have from now until November the 30th, 2021, to become fully vaccinated. To achieve this, unvaccinated staff should receive their first dose by October the 31st, 2021, and their second dose by November the 30th. 
By November the 30th, all employees should submit proof of full vaccination. Employees who are not vaccinated will need to produce a negative PCR or rapid test result within 72 hours of every scheduled workday or shift on an ongoing basis. These tests will be required and will be paid for by the employees. Employees who are unable to be vaccinated, for example, due to a medical condition, will be required to obtain an accommodation based on the Alberta Human Rights Act. We've seen that several public, sec public and private sector employers within and outside the province have implemented similar vaccine policies for their employees. I will add that the restrictions exemption program will be implemented in government of Alberta, of Alberta facilities, such as the Jubilee Auditoria, museums, and some historic sites. This is consistent with other Alberta venues so that Albertans can continue to support local artists and business in a safe manner. Vaccination is the most effective tool to reduce the risk of COVID-19 for Albertans and to protect the health care system. I want to thank all those public service employees who are already vaccinated. Thanks. All right, folks, that concludes our formal remarks today. And we're now going to move over to a media Q&A. Uh, for those people uh, who have joined us in person, please queue up at the microphone to ask your question. Uh, and for those of us online, please state who your question is directed to. Uh, as we have all of our Calgary media joining us on the phones today, we're going to hop there first before going to Edmonton to finish it. Uh, so with that, operator, can you please put through our first caller? Bruce, State Kaiser, 660 News. Hi, good uh, evening. My question for the Premier. Mr. Kenny, you're out here dispelling rumours of a lockdown, but a lot of the people who are suggesting it are the same ones who predicted that we'd be in the situation. And, I mean, last time they spoke up, they were pretty much ignored. So I guess what I'm asking is, should their suggestions be ignored again? Well, I don't know whose suggestions you're referring to or what suggestions they are. Uh, I'm here announcing today that uh, Cabinet has just approved a proof of vaccination program uh, for the Alberta Public Service, as well as our uh, finalization of uh, deployment of medical personnel from the Canadian Armed Forces, the Canadian Red Cross, and welcoming a medical team from Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so uh, this is, uh, we, we We'll be meeting next week as cabinet, but there are no other measures that are uh, currently under consideration. As I said uh, two days ago, we continue to monitor, monitor closely the uh, the trends. We want to see the impact of the measures that became effective on Monday of last week. Uh, what we are seeing um, as a general trend is uh, an apparent plateauing of cases. We've been averaging about 20,000 total active cases for roughly the last uh, two weeks. Um, we, we want to see the numbers go and begin to decline, of course, uh, and that's why we're urging uh, all Albertans carefully to follow the public health guidelines, uh, but also those who are unvaccinated to step up and get and get that protection. And uh, Sage, did you have a follow-up at all? Uh, yeah, I did, Harrison. Thanks. Uh, now, Mr. Premier, you said this fourth wave is caused by the unvaccinated. You've said that in the past. Now we're seeing people uh, dying or struggling in the healthcare system because it's trying to support all these people. So uh, how do you plan to get through to anti-vaxxers who so far have ignored every piece of evidence and common sense that uh, your government's provided? Well, <clears throat> let me say, I think amongst the 17 or now 16% of adults who are unvaccinated, they're not all committed to, to the so-called anti-vaccine ideology. Obviously, some are. Uh, our public opinion research suggests that about 7 to 9% of the Alberta adult population uh, won't get a vaccine under any circumstances. That's what they tell us, and, and that's very unfortunate. We'll continue to provide them with information, offer the incentives, um, and uh, and do what we can. But there are other uh, Albertans who are what I would characterize either vaccine indifferent or vaccine hesitant, but they're not completely opposed to vaccines per se. Um, the vaccine indifferent are typically, I believe, younger adults in good health who don't 
spend a lot of time worrying about their health and, and, and for whom this sort of thing just isn't really on their radar screen. Um, and I think the recently introduced res restriction exemption program has helped to perhaps nudge some of them uh, to get vaccinated so they can continue to go to bars and restaurants and uh, things like that. Um, the, uh, in terms of the vaccine hesitant, people who continue to have uh, concerns or fears, um, we will be launching a new multi-million dollar public information campaign uh, to provide them with accurate information on everything about the safety vaccines, um, questions around fertility and all of that. Um, we do understand, and I've, I've been hearing this from rural leaders. In fact, just yesterday I was uh, meeting with representatives of the Rural Municipalities Association and, of course, always listening to uh, rural members of the Alberta legislature. And apparently a, a lot of, because the, uh, as you know, uh, the under vaccination problem is, is greatest in uh, rural areas. And uh, what we're hearing are, are some of the vaccine hesitant in those regions um, tell us they are willing to take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, but are hesitant for one reason or another about the mRNAs and AstraZeneca. So that's why we're um, asking the federal government to help to source this additional supply. I don't know how many people that is, but every uh, additional person vaccinated for us is one small win. Okay, thank you. Uh, operator, can you please put through our next call? Thank you. Alicia Corbella, Post Media. Uh, thank you. That first question is for uh, Dr. Yu. Um, I was just wondering, Dr. Yu, if you could give us a little bit more information about the nurse, nurse who passed. Did she pass um, away from COVID? Uh, just a little bit more detail, if that's possible. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, as you know, uh, this is in confidential information. We're not able to really share any details. Uh, but as I said, we do want to express our sincere condolences for the family and loved ones. Okay, Lisa, do you have a follow-up at all? Yeah, it's for Tim Grant. And um, I'm wondering, do we have, do we know how many, uh, what percentage of the public service is currently vaccinated? And if they're, they refuse to pay for a vaccine, I mean, for the vaccine um, testing, or not vaccine testing, for um, the, the COVID test, and if they refuse to get vaccinated, will they be fired? What, what will happen to them? So I'll answer the, the second question first. Um, no, we're not going to fire anyone. Um, our, our aim is to, to encourage and educate all the members of the public service um, to get vaccinated. We believe that's the, the best, the safest, the, the most appropriate route to go. Um, however, if at the end of the day, an individual decides that they won't get vaccinated, they don't have an exemption, we can't accommodate them, and they do not want to get um, tested, um, then we would put them on uh, unpaid leave. And sorry, Lucia, can you repeat your first question again? Yeah, what percentage of the public service is currently va double vaccinated? Yeah, so we don't have an accurate number on that right now. What we're doing is is on the assumption that um, it's it's in the range of about uh, fifteen percent, as as the province is as a whole of unvaccinated between fifteen and twenty percent. We're, we're looking at about four thousand members of the um, the Alberta Public Service who probably fall in, into that category. But it's it's based on statistics across the province, as opposed to having done a survey. Thank you, Commissioner Grant. Uh, operator, can you please put through our next call? James Keller, Globe and Mail. Hi there, a question to the Premier. Back to this uh, Johnson & Johnson request. It sounds like this was a coordinated effort with BC and Saskatchewan, if that's right. So can you tell me, do you know the total ask uh, for these three provinces? And just sort of logistically, as far as I know, Ottawa doesn't have any of the Janssen vaccine. So what is happening to uh, get that supply? Sure. So Minister Copping has spoken to his counterparts in BC and Saskatchewan. Uh, they both uh, echoed our desire uh, to get supply. The federal government uh, destroyed its inventory of Johnson & Johnson vaccines that were uh, being held by the National Operations Centre uh, because of quality.
control issues out of the Baltimore plant where they had been produced. Uh, but given the um, apparent uptick in interest uh, in some people in receiving that vaccine, we, we want to uh, uh, get some supply here. And so the I understand the minimum order uh, is 24,000 doses. We had initially asked for 20,000, but together with our neighboring provinces, I, I think we're we're looking at a larger uh, uh, order. I, I probably in the range of 50,000 doses for all three provinces. I, we were working out details with the government of Canada. Yesterday, the prime minister said that um, they do have an ongoing procurement contract with Johnson & Johnson, so they're confident that they can obtain supply. Uh, we don't, apparently Canada, the National Operations Centre does not have any supply and inventory right now, uh, but uh, he and federal officials told us that they are hopeful they'll be able to access some supply for next week. And, and by the way, uh, James, I know that this may sound um, Peculiar to some folks that that we're we're seeking this uh, particular supply, um, given the data on the relative efficacy of different vaccines. But at the end of the day, if there are some people who've done their own research and concluded that they will only take the J and J, that that provides important protection, and we want to help to get that to them. Okay, thank you, Premier James. Do you have a follow up at all? Yeah, I mean, you just expand. You, you mentioned it a bit earlier, talking about the MNRA and AstraZeneca concerns among some of these people. Like, like, what do we know about who these people are? Where are they? Are they primarily in rural areas? And is what specifically is driving this uh, this desire to have the the Janssen vaccine as opposed to these other vaccines? Well, uh, we've only heard this request anecdotally, but from many um, rural MLAs uh, and municipal leaders. Uh, as well as from some folks working in rural health care. So this has become uh, enough of a, a drumbeat of requests that we think the demand is, is real. It's hard for us to, to quantify it at this point. Um, and if you ask me to speculate, I, I think that there has been, you know, on the Internet, um, a, a fair bit of misinformation about the safety and efficacy of the mRNA vaccines. Um, and it, often it is, uh, the, these are, uh, mischaracterized as, quote, experimental vaccines that don't have proper approval and so forth. As you know, MNR, mRNA technology has been used for many years, so, and it, this is hardly experimental given that um, the Pfizer and Moderna have been used, uh, I think over 4 billion doses have been administered around the world. Let me share with you here in Alberta, our mainstay vaccine, about, I think about 70% of doses administered have been Pfizer. And uh, of um, 6.1 million doses administered uh, to over 3 million Albertans, we have so far reported uh, fewer than 1,600 adverse events, of which only one was a fatality related to a myocardial inf uh, infraction from a woman um, in her 40s uh, following an AstraZeneca dose. Uh, so um, we are... are real world experience in Alberta is that the three vaccines we have on offer, Pfizer, Moderna and uh, AstraZeneca are safe. We certainly know that they are effective. Since July the 1st, 19, only 19% 19 of uh, positive PCR uh, confirmed cases were amongst people who were uh, unvaccinated. So, um, excuse me, were amongst people who were vaccinated, which is to say, uh, that 80, 81 percent of our cases have been amongst the uh, unvaccinated 20 percent of the population. So we believe this, that, that the data, the science is clear that the vaccines we currently offer are safe and effective. But if some people have uh, curated their own information about this and have come to their own conclusions, we'll respect that. And uh, Johnson & Johnson has been approved for safe usage in Canada. So we want to make that available to those folks if they want the choice. Okay, operator, can you please put through our next call? Thank you, Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have a question and a supplementary for the Premier. Uh, Premier Kenny, I'd like you to help me with this question because I'm asked a lot about it, and it's probably because people have this desire to sort of find who's responsible for what. So the question is, um, how much of the situation that we're in today, a pretty dire situation that we're in today in Alberta, is, in your opinion, the result of your government's actions, and how much of it is a result of 
other factors that aren't your government's actions. So I think it's the responsibility question that people are still curious about what your answer is. Well, Rick, I would just say this, that uh, COVID is a intractable problem that governments in every region of the world have been trying to address uh, through trial and error. Uh, virtually every country or region has faced uh, spikes in cases, uh, even though they've had radically different policy settings. You know, I recall the other day uh, a journalist asked if Saskatchewan and Alberta were now going through an identical wave because they both have conservative governments. Well, we have eight ostensibly uh, conservative or center-right governments in Canada with a range of different outcomes and a range of different policies. In the spring, Ontario was at exactly where we are today in terms of per capita ICU admissions, even though they had a hard lockdown in place for months. Uh, Manitoba was in a worse, much worse situation in the spring, even though they'd had hard lockdown po policies in place. Uh, Sweden has a social democratic government, and um, there's a big debate about their response, uh, uh, the efficacy of their response, but it was very much on uh, the, the uh, minimal restrictions side of the spectrum. Australia has a center-right government that has had repeated uh, repeated the hardest lockdowns in the democratic world. Um, and and we, ca it's a hard, we have a hard time accounting for, in places like that, all of the negative consequences of restrictions. So Rick, I, I guess what I would say is that there are many, many factors that, that drive this disease. Right now, uh, what we are experiencing in this fourth wave uh, is a reflection of the fact that Alberta and Saskatchewan have had the lowest levels of vaccination. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, thankfully, that's beginning to change here. So uh, governments have to take some of the responsibility. Uh, individuals who don't uh, um, stay at home when they're sick have to. People who don't get vaccinated have to as well. I'm not interested in the blame game. I'm just interested in us getting through this, supporting our healthcare workers, increasing the vaccine rates, reducing transmission while we increase capacity. That's our focus. Uh, thanks, Premier. And Rick, your follow-up? Uh, yes, the follow-up is um, in the last uh, recent hours and days, we've heard a, a lot from certain groups, including doctors, about lockdowns or wanting more restrictions or wanting wanting a lockdown, and they've uh, spoken and written in very, very strong language about a system on the, at the breaking point and a system that's, you know, uh, in perilous straits. Uh, today, you were uh, speaking a, a couple different occasions about cases are plateauing, and um, you're still sort of looking to see if this is a longer trend, but it sounded a little bit different from what we were hearing from those groups that have spoken in the recent hours and days, uh, where it, they sounded like it was really, really bad, and it's going to get probably even worse. So who, who are we supposed to believe right now? Are we supposed to believe that we could very well be at the plateau now and that we could actually be going down in, you know, a few days or, or a week or so? Or should we believe those people who say if something is not further done, if something is more drastic is done, not done, that the situation will get worse and worse and worse? Who are well, we supposed to believe now? Well, you, you should absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't accept that there's a, a disagreement at all about the severe pressure that the healthcare system is under. Uh, I I just spoke to that very bluntly today and. Two days ago, where our uh, we've had to more than double our ICU capacity to uh, provide care for people. We're not today operating at 180 percent of our typical baseline ICU capacity. To put that in in plain language, um, that is 180 percent more than uh, ICU beds than we typically have to provide to people. That is extreme stress. And our healthcare workers are uh, under enormous pressure coping with that. Uh, that is for real. 
And that is why we have taken extraordinary measures. It's why we have province-wide public health measures, mandatory masking, capacity limits, a ban on indoor socializing uh, for people who are not vaccinated, the restriction exemption program, protocols in schools. And uh, it, it's uh, why we have these measures in place. Now, um, what will happen in the future? I, nobody has a, a crystal ball. But I'm just telling you that in terms of total active cases, they've been relatively stable for a couple of weeks. That is by, by no means do I, does, should anybody take from that that we are out of the woods. Um, a, a cold snap that forces everybody indoors, upcoming Thanksgiving holidays uh, and, and family gatherings, um, a, a lot of different things could suddenly increase transmission. Uh, so we are watching all of the trends very carefully. We um, want to see the full impact of the latest rounds of serious public health measures that we introduced just 10 days, uh, 10 or 11 days ago. Um, and, and that's uh, where we are uh, as we continue to, to see real momentum on the vaccine program. So uh, increasing capacity, reducing transmission, increasing vaccination, that is our strategy. Uh, and we ask all Albertans to help us make those happen. Okay, we have time for about two more questions from the phone before we head over to Edmonton. Uh, operator, can you please put through our next caller? Dean Bennett, Canadian Press. Oh, oh hi, Premier. Uh, just following up on what Rick Bell is saying, uh, this is all predicated on the fact that you have the luxury of time. You've got more than a thousand cases a day here, and, and you're willing to push the health system. Even you are saying that, well, we could, you know, we're very close to the tipping point here. Why do you feel that you have the uh, the luxury of time here? And why don't you give the doctors what they're asking for, which is a lockdown? So, uh, once again, we are under a very serious pressure in the healthcare system, which is why we brought in uh, wide-ranging uh, public health measures, including uh, the restriction exemption program, including abandoned or socializing for people who are unvaccinated, including capacity limits in all kinds of commercial and social activity. Um, so uh, now having said that, Dean, uh, the, uh, we have to ensure that the measures that we adopt actually have a meaningful impact. The crisis that we are dealing with comes uh, overwhelmingly from the unvaccinated a population, which is now 16% of adults. We need to address that, which is what the, the current measures seek to do. Uh, and uh, we, will cons we will take additional action uh, if it is necessary uh, to protect the healthcare system, but any additional measures have to deal with that issue. And I, I, I've mentioned this before, and I'll, I'll do it again, um, that, that the, the, policy, uh, the policy tools that may have been effective in earlier waves are less relevant now because we're not dealing with 100% of the population. We're really primarily dealing with 16% of the population, a relatively small group who are um, uh, le far less likely to comply with public health restrictions, to uh, stay at home if they are ill, uh, to get tested, to co cooperate with tracing. That is a predicament that we are facing. Uh, and uh, it, and so the, the policy tools that we use when we are addressing 100% of the uh, population are, are different than what we are coping with now. But we continue to monitor the situation. If additional measures need to be taken, they will. And do you have a follow-up, Dean? Thanks. A question for uh, Dr. Yu. I think Albertans would like to know it's getting a bit confusing, Dr. Yu, about where we're at on uh, triage protocols. I mean, uh, the Premier said two weeks ago we were 10 days away, which suggests to me we have metrics for it. But then you said, well, we haven't developed the metrics yet. Can you please give Albertans kind of a, a, a state of play with specifics in terms of where we're at with triage protocol? And could it be brought in in a regional basis? So, for example, in the north, we've got more than 100% capacity. So I would think if you had a bad say, God forbid, bus accident, then you might actually have to use the triage protocol in the door. So that's my rambling question. So just to say that the critical care triage tool is absolutely the last resort. It's not something that we ever want to do in Alberta, and we would have to 
use up all the resources that we have uh, before we would ever get to that point. And that would include all the additional actions that uh, was announced today, in addition to you know out of province transfers and so on and so forth. Uh, when we look at sort of, um, as you mentioned, sort of that regional approach, I think one of the benefits of Alberta Health Services is that we are a provincial entity. And over the past several weeks, we've been doing what we call load leveling, which is basically helping to support the areas where in fact the capacity may be at 100%. So for example, in, in the central zone where we know that the Red Deer Regional Hospital is consistently at uh, more than 100% of its usual capacity, um, uh, over the last weekend, in fact, we were diverting patients who needed ICU care to Calgary and to Edmonton, which had some additional capacity in place. And we've been doing this all along for the North Zone, uh, for both Fort McMurray and QE2, where we've, um, if we need to, we actually can divert patients uh, so that they can actually receive the type of care that they need in a critical care setting uh, where there is actually um, available space. Right now, in terms of the critical triage, we are, um, as I said, in the continued phase of educating our staff. Uh, we have a provincial approach to the critical care triage. As I said, we ev don't ever want to use the critical care triage, and we'll continue to do that, all that we can do to create more capacity. And uh, Dean, if I could just add a little context, because you mentioned something I said two or three weeks ago about uh, uh, potentially having to look at triage um, by September 23rd. That was based on our, our kind of worst case scenario projections uh, we, that we might have run out of province wide ICU capacity by September 23rd. Uh, but thanks to a significant expansion in capacity, um, available ICU beds, and a reduction in the growth rate of transmission, uh, thankfully we have avoided that uh, circumstance in September. Uh, and um, and so the cur that, that curve is, is a little flatter than the worst case scenario that we were looking at three weeks ago, but also there is additional capacity. So just to offer that context uh, for the remarks I made three weeks ago. Thank you. Uh, operator, can you please put through our last caller? Tim Brook, CTV. Hi, thanks. Uh, this one's for the Premier. Um, as far as public sector employees go getting the vaccine, is there any plan within your government right now to make vaccines uh, mandatory for all elected officials as well, including MLAs and their staff? That's a good question. I meant to actually, uh, originally I was going to address that in my opening uh, comments. Um, we are in discussions with the opposition, uh, the Speaker of the Assembly and the Legislative Assembly Office, uh, the government's uh, being represented by the House Leader in those discussions about uh, how to replicate this kind of policy for the operation of the legislature, both the Assembly itself, the elected members, but also uh, staff. And um, we, a, a final protocol has not been agreed to, but uh, what we are looking at is is a very similar policy that if that uh, uh, for members uh, that they should be asked to either provide proof of vaccination or uh, a regular negative test result as well as for staff uh, working in the building and on the legislature precinct um, there is uh, uh, I'll just add one thing here which is that, I mean there's a constitutional issue that that we have to carefully think through and that is, it's a long-standing constitutional principle, a uh, legal principle that you can't uh, prohibit an elected member from entering the chamber. Um, but um, uh, we, are, we are trying to sort out uh, how to uh, apply a policy like this while recognizing that long-standing constitutional principle. And Tim, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, uh, I know Newfoundland and Labrador are going to send some people. I know, uh, you know, the federal government is going to help out a little bit, too. Uh, I'm just curious to know what other provinces or agencies have, have reached out to uh, Alberta offering help. And uh, if there are any that uh, are not going to send help, why aren't they? So... A number of other provinces are facing extreme stress, including our two neighbors. Um, Saskatchewan is, is, as I said, they've got a higher per capita ICU COVID count than we do today. And, and British Columbia is shifting patients from the north and the interior to the lower mainland. So they don't have any spare hospital capacity. In fact, we have nine um, ICU patients from those two provinces in our in our own hospitals right now. Um, Manitoba uh, has said that they, they might be able to accept 
a, a small number of ICU patients throughout a province transfers if absolutely necessary, and if we have to go there in a worst case scenario. I also want to thank uh, Premier Gertsen and uh, Manitoba for having shared with us some surplus uh, monoclonal antibody drugs, which is a, uh, a, a therapeutic a treatment that we use early in, in the hospitals uh, for, for people um, to prevent severe uh, outcomes. Um, uh, Ontario has uh, offered uh, access to, um, again, interprovincial transfers should it be necessary, just as we offered that to them in the spring. Um, Quebec might be able to do something with respect to cardiac, uh, their, their uh, crit critical cardiac unit, and, um, and, and, and apart from that, Newfoundland. Now, uh, but every, I mean, every province has been, they're, they're following our situation, they're in solidarity with us and Saskatchewan that's facing uh, very similar pressures, uh, just as we've been there for them. And uh, like I say, this is a great example of getting through this uh, together. I think it's a particularly a wonderful Canadian story to see the, the Newfoundland medical team wanting to go to Fort McMurray, uh, where undoubtedly they'll, they'll be treating many people who grew up in Newfoundland and Labrador. Okay, thank you, Premier. We're now going to jump over to the uh, reporters who've shown up in person in Edmonton today. I understand there are two of them in line, which will be our last two questions. And just a reminder to please state your name, uh, the outlet you're with, as well as the person you're directing your question to. And with that, uh, whoever's first at the mic, I'll let you go. Hi, it's Janet French from the CBC. Question is for the Premier. Two days ago, you said that we didn't need help from Newfoundland and the Canadian Armed Forces, that we weren't there yet, that you saw the peak of this in, in late October in Alberta. So now you're saying your arrangements are underway and help is on the way. So what changed in the last two days? No, I didn't say that. I said we were in ongoing conversations with Newfoundland and the Canadian Armed Forces, but that I had indicated that we were not facing a worst case scenario uh, imminently. Um, as I just uh, offered to, to Dean Bennett, uh, we were like when, when I when the Premier of Newfoundland and I first spoke um, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we were looking at a potential worst case scenario hitting us on September 23rd, and I simply conveyed because I'm you know we are try to be conscious about the resources of other governments of, uh, of in this case Newfoundland and the Canadian Armed Forces. So we've just been tr we've tried to be transparent with them about where we are at, what our projections are when our peak demand might arrive. But um, we've had ongoing conversations and, and both have said that they'd be happy to support us where we're at right now. And any additional support is welcome. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, between um, the Canadian Armed Forces, the Canadian Red Cross, and the uh, medical team from Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we may be able to staff up an additional four or five ICU beds, but that's helpful. Uh, every bit counts. And it means uh, perhaps a bit of relief for our overstressed uh, workers, but it, it also may mean that we have a little extra capacity to deal with, uh, uh, with surgical pressures as well. So we just wanted to be transparent with our partners about where we're at, when we expect might be a worst case scenario. Uh, and we've been you know, working on the, the best kind of deployment of these additional resources, which we very much appreciate. And Janet, do you have a follow-up today? I do. This is about um, giving school boards the option rather than mandating them to um, ask their staff to be vaccinated. I mean, children aged 5 to 11 right now are the fastest growing age demographic of new COVID cases. And when it was left up to school divisions and school boards to decide on public health measures when school first opened, we saw a complete smorgasbord of options across the province um, where even schools on the same street under different boards were doing different things. Why would you leave another health decision up to school boards to make when these people are in charge of education? Well, because we're talking about their employees. The teachers and support staff are not employees of the government of Alberta. They are employees of the school boards. Uh, we don't have uh, the legal, the statutory authority uh, to impose particular conditions of employment on their uh, uh, the employees with whom they have uh, work agreements. Um, and uh, and so that is why we have decided to um, the, for the government of Alberta through the ministers of health and education to to write to the Alberta school boards uh, asking that they uh, institute similar policies uh, recognizing their their own governance authority. Minister Kopp, would you like to add to that?
thanks, Premier. That's that's exactly correct. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, we as as uh, government, uh, we have direct responsibility in employment relationships with uh, our with our own employees, so we can actually institute this policy. Um, and and uh, quite frankly, the, the premier has also been. Uh, we've been talking with other employers across the. Uh, across the province, in terms of in instituting like policies, a vaccine policy with with the uh, uh, with the p potential for rapid tests uh, or something like that, and do it on an industry wide basis. Uh, so similarly, we are asking the, uh, the school boards to uh, to look at their policy as an employer uh, to do the same thing. Okay, thank you, Minister. We'll now move to our last question for the day. Uh, you can go ahead at the microphone in Edmonton. Hi, thanks for taking my question. It's Lisa Johnson from the Edmonton Journal. Um, just to follow up on Janet's questions, um, you're talking about legal and statutory um, kind of barriers to expanding this um, vaccine requirement to public sector workers. Um, if we can't do it in Alberta, how come they can do that in other provinces with, with school teachers? Nova Scotia. So, uh, well, thank you for the question. I understand in Nova Scotia they, they have done that, um, uh, but in that circumstance, um, they don't actually have boards. The uh, province is the employer uh, of the uh, of, of teachers and those working in in the, in the schools, and that's not the case we have here in Alberta. Okay, Lisa, did you have a follow up at all? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, just roughly speaking, in terms of uh, vaccination protection, it takes about two weeks after your first dose for for some protection to kick in, and then. Uh, if you hypothetically have a month in between doses, we're, we're talking about six weeks from now, um, potentially about 15% of a 25,000 worker workforce will be vaccinated uh, based on this announcement today. So I'm wondering, Premier, if you're confident this, what's being announced today, this and the assistance from other provinces and, and the Canadian Red Cross and the Armed Forces, are you confident that this is going to address the hospital crisis that we're facing right now? Well, this isn't going to immediately abate the pressure on our hospitals. Uh, uh, but uh, first of all, the additional help, uh, while uh, you know, four or five ICU beds are, um, it, it is just that, it's, it's a helping hand. It will help to provide some relief in some of our hospitals. That is very welcome. Uh, and we hope to have be welcoming some of those additional healthcare professionals uh, from Newfoundland, the Red Cross, and the forces. Um, it, but, but Verna could give us an update, but uh, I think some might be ar arriving as early as next week. Um, in terms of the vaccine policies, yeah, you're right, there is a lag time there. Um, but while we are rightfully concerned about the current pressure on the hospitals, we should be equally concerned about how long that continues and how bad it gets. And um, that is why we just have to keep pushing on all fronts to push up those vaccine numbers. Uh, we shouldn't, um, let, me, let me put it this way, uh, we, we, we have to manage with the current uh, capacity crisis in the hospitals as we are doing but we also have to just use every tool at our disposal to get vaccine rates up because we got into this due to having uh, the lowest vaccine rates in Canada here and in our neighboring uh, province of Saskatchewan. Um, so uh, every bit helps. I mean, we've gone from 78 to, I think by tonight, 84% first dose coverage amongst adults. Yes, there's the lag effect and everything, but that means we will be much, much better uh, prepared to, to limit transmission and severe outcomes as we get into October, as we get into colder weather. And, and that's, that's a, that is some good news. And I would love it if little measures like this, I mean, look, we're not, I'm sure that, that over, I hope that over 90% of people in the Alberta Public Service are already vaccinated. So at the end of the day, this policy may only uh, help increase uh, vaccine rates by a few thousand, but every bit matters. We are asking the private sector to do the same thing. We need to lead by example as well. If we all continue to do that, I believe we can have continued momentum on the vaccine rates. Um, and I, I'm now confident that we'll get over 85%. If we can get up into the high 90s of first dose coverage and the vast majority of those people coming forward for their second dose, we will be in a much better position to deal with um, the cold months uh, to come. And, and that will be very welcome relief for our uh, highly stressed healthcare workers. 
Okay, thanks very much, folks. That concludes today's Thank media you. availability.